he will uh, talk to us generally about how the black hole image was made. It's a very interesting topic. And more particularly today, he will um, give a lecture on uh, the fundamentals of radio interferometry. So let me thank Dr. Hodgson again for agreeing to do this. And um, for everyone else, please keep your microphone muted during the talk and raise your ha hand if you have any questions. Okay, thank you and have a good lecture. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so thanks for the introduction. So my name is uh, yeah, Jeff Hodgson. I'm an assistant professor here at uh, Sejong University in Seoul in South Korea. So actually, uh, we've just been in the news recently. So if you, uh, you might have seen that there was a zebra running around on the loose in Seoul that actually happened to uh, <laughs> be right next to the university here. <laughs> So we're kind of famous, of course, for that now. Um, cool. So let's let's move let's move into it. Um, talk a little bit about me. Uh, so yeah, Jeff Hodgson. You can just call me Jeff. So I am in, I'm a radio astronomer, um, and in particular, what I work on is um, is very long baseline interferometry, uh, which is kind of a, a big long word, but we call that we just call that VLBI. Um, and probably uh, that's, it's the most famous for being the technique that produced the uh, the black hole image that we have up here in the top top right. Um, so what do I do? Like in scientifically speaking, I work on stuff like uh, basically observational cosmology is my big uh, current focus using VLBI to measure distances to quasars and blazars, these sorts of things. But I also dabble in uh, high energy astrophysics, so gamma rays and uh, the um, how the gamma rays are produced around black holes and quasars, uh, that sort of thing. Um, originally, I'm from uh, Perth in Western Australia. Um, and then I went to do, do my PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn in, in Germany. And then I moved to Korea, where I where I still am which is uh, kind of cool. So it turns out that Korea actually is one of the uh, the best places in the world to be doing this kind of very long baseline interferometry or VLBI. Uh, in fact, they have their own network. It's called the Korean VLBI network. And that's uh, that's why I'm here in Korea, in fact. Um, just before we get into the into the serious stuff, I would say Romania is, pretty, is a pretty cool place. I've actually been to Romania many times. Um, and in fact, I have a residency permit for for Romania, which uh, is a bit of a long story. You're probably wondering uh, why an Australian who lives in South Korea has a has a residency permit for Romania. And the short answer is Brexit. And if you ever if you're interested in the long story, you can always ask me any time. Uh, Cluj is actually probably my my favorite city that I've been to in Romania. Although I'd say that uh, for pure sightseeing, I'd say that uh, Sigisoara is my favorite place uh, to take photos in in Romania. So that's uh, so that's all very exciting and everything, uh, but I, you guys are here to learn about uh, radio interferometry, not uh, about my sightseeing in Romania. So I have a question. Um, so I sent out an email earlier this, week that was asking to see if anyone is able to install diffmap um can i maybe put a either reply here or talk in the chat how did people go with doing this um yeah you can un unmute for this or if you had any problems now's a good time to to bring it up or yeah so did anyone actually manage to install diffmap? Any yeses or noes in the in the, in the chat? Uh, yes, yeah, so if you're using Windows 10, you have to get the Windows subsystem for Linux up and running. That's the the hard bit. Um, uh, 
yeah, so I can uh, I'll quit out of the out of this for a second. So if you have diff map up and running, uh, should look something like this. Uh, so you can just start a diff map like this, and then um, let's go observe. Uh, maybe not here actually. Oh. If you start diff map it, yeah, it should should be just this little little thing like this. Uh, cool. So, but one person installed, but uh, this is meant to be quite a bit of, a bit of a hands on lecture. So if um, wasn't sure how well people have gone with this. Uh, any more feedback on this? Of course, it's a little bit tricky to do this online. I, I will admit. Uh, I'm just going to get everyone to interact with it, um, and if there's any any problems, we you can, we can uh, try and fix it between now and next week, when we try to do some more stuff. But yes, yeah, so diffmap. So basically, it's a sort of old but good software. So basically, the aim here is that it takes it from the image on the left to the image on the right. Um, it's a bit more of an art than a science to do these sorts of things, and that's kind of the thing I want to talk about today. Um, so, but I really would like a little bit more feedback when it comes to the installation, uh, any success or failures with it. But all right, nevertheless, let's let's move on. So, uh, thanks to Dr. Lung for the excellent introduction in the last couple of weeks. So I think it, hopefully everyone has a has a pretty good overview of the, of the basics of how uh, radio astronomy works and the sort of the sort of things that we that we see in the sky, um, and so on the right here you can see some examples from some uh, radio telescopes around the world. So in the top right is the Very Large Array or the VLA, um, so called because astronomers have a terrible uh, taste in naming things. Um, and in the the middle here is. Uh, the Murchison Widefield Array. So basically, that's just a bunch of wires on the ground. So there's very low frequency uh, radio interferometry. Um, and on the right, of course, is the is the well, the bottom there is the is the black hole image from the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, on the on the middle right there, you can see the the uh, Centaurus A, which I'll come back to. And once again, this is these are. Um, these on the very right here, zooming in right on where the black hole is, and you have these jets of material coming out, and we can resolve this to a very large degree. So, so basically, uh, the technique that I'm talking about today is called, as I said, it's called very long baseline interferometry, and it, can, it offers about uh, something like a, a thousand times better resolution than, say, what the James Webb Space Telescope can do. So it's actually the highest resolution telescope, uh, form, like basically form of astronomy that we have. Um, which is funny because uh, so we talked a lot about the single dish telescopes last week uh, and last two weeks with Dr. Lung, uh, but they actually have a problem, which is that they have a very low resolution, um, and we'll talk more about that. But basically, the the resolution of your telescope is related to the uh, the wavelength and the, the the diameter of your amateur aperture. Sorry. Um, but there is a solution to this. So basically, if you're at uh, centimeter wavelengths. And your your dish size is you know a few meters across or something. Your re resolving power is very low. Uh, but as I said, there is a solution to this, and this is uh, interferometry, specifically aperture synthesis. Um, and this is a pretty big deal. So actually, Sir Baden Royal and Anthony Hewish won the Nobel Prize in 1974 for developing uh, radio interferometry, basically the VLBI. Uh, so basically, the idea of what we're doing here is that we are trying to connect many dishes into one gigantic dish. 
Um, and if you, so in the top right here, you have the VLA array, so kind of famous from the movie Contact, if you've ever seen it. Um, that's a, what we call a connected element interferometer. So all these, all the telescopes there are connected by wire and to a central uh, building, basically, where they are correlated. We don't need to worry about that for now. Um, and then they can create an image out of out of those uh, radio data. But if uh, your telescopes are scattered all over the world, then you can't really easily connect them by wire. So we have to basically record the data to disk and then send them back because it turns out that the internet is not fast enough to to do uh, this sort of thing. It turns out at the sort of recording rates that we do for for VLBI actually snail mail is faster than the internet. So what are the aims of uh, the lecture and the next of this lecture and the next? Well, uh, basically, I want to give it more of a feeling for how interferometry works. So, um, I, I'm kind of going to be avoiding going too deeply into the maths. I, I sort of want to teach uh, an intuition for how to do uh, interferometry and what, what we're really doing at a fundamental level. So uh, depending how we go on progress, we might try to measure superluminal motions or even try to image up the actual black hole image up. So we also see that. And of course, my ultimate aim here is to make radio astronomers out of everyone here. So, so it's maybe a little bit of an ambitious thing to do, but let's let's see how we go. So uh, Dr. Lung spoke about this the other day. So in radio astronomy, there's a lot more than meets the eye. And I really like this picture that I'm showing here. So on, on the right is the picture of Centaurus A. And this is, this is a southern source, so I'm Australian, so obviously I'm a little bit biased, I like it. But the obviously the image on the right is, is photoshopped, but it gives a sense of this actual scale of the galaxy. So the, the galaxy is, you know, maybe like 100 times larger than the moon on the sky, but we can't see it because it's in the radio. And uh, obviously our eyes are not sensitive to the radio. So we... Uh, use radio telescopes, in, in this case, the Australia Telescope Compact Array, or ATCA, uh, made this image of Centaurus A, and it's a, as you can see, it's a very, very beautiful image. Now, the, the question is, what happens if we want to zoom in? Well, to higher frequencies, i.e. shorter wavelengths, and we can increase the distance between our radio telescopes. But, you know, that's easy for me to say. What, what does that you know, really mean in practice? Uh, oh, yes, I should bring up the uh, the relevant XKCD, uh, which is always good. Um, so interferometry is so cool. Uh, you know, if you put two small dogs a large distance apart, they can function as a single giant dog. And then, of course, uh, that's not really how it works. But uh, that basically does... It's basically how it works for radio telescopes. Um, maybe it works for radio dogs. I'm I'm not sure, but we shall see. So, how good actually is the resolution here? Um, so the eye is able to resolve about one arc second, something like that. Um, it has an optical wavelength of about two millimeters. Sorry, a, uh, sorry, an aperture of about two millimeters, and uh, that gives about one, yeah, about one arc second, and that's about equivalent to what the GBT telescope. This is the uh, giant, so not the giant, the yeah, Green Bank Telescope in um, in the United States. So to give a, to give you an idea, I might just go uh, make a make a new tab, green. Bank telescope. Uh, this is it here. So this is the green telescope over here. So as you can see, it's really, really big. It's uh, over. Uh, so it's the, actually the biggest steerable dish in the world. And that has the same. 
resolving power as your eyes. So that's <laughs> that's not so not such a uh, good or not not such a high red array. Um, your typical amateur telescope with a an aperture of about 10 centimeters. So the mirror inside the telescope would be about 10 centimeters. That's equivalent to having a uh, a radio telescope at four centimeters um, frequency, or sorry, uh, I should say wavelength. Uh, is it roughly equivalent to the very large array, uh, something like this? The Hubble Space Telescope is and so that and i should say that's about 10 times better resolution than the eye um the hubble space telescope that's capable of doing something like uh, five uh five arc seconds also well, so it says, uh, so 0 0.05 arc seconds yeah arc minutes arc seconds yeah and that has a optical aperture of about two meters and that's equivalent to having a radio telescope at four centimeters that's about the size of the united kingdom uh, so merlin is a is a telescope in the uk which uh, which observes that basically you know interesting stuff so it's basically equivalent to that and then what's well, the interferometer here that basically means uh, vlbi so that's equivalent to a 100 meter uh, optical telescope which of course does not exist um, and that gives something like one uh, milli arc second um, resolution, which uh, is basically similar to uh, seeing the surface of Io, on which is one of the moons around Jupiter. So that's uh, that's pretty good. And in fact, we can do even better than that. So if we go to if we inc increase the observing frequency, which is the same as decreasing the observing wavelength, uh, we can go to even better. So we can get about 50 micro arc seconds using the GMVA, or for the Event Horizon Telescope, we're talking about 20 micro arc seconds angular resolution. And so that would be, uh, basically, if you put your smartphone on the moon, we could resolve it, at least if it was, if, so long as it was bright enough that we could detect it. In principle, we can resolve your smartphone on the moon. So that gives you, or another way to think about this, you know, if you're in, um, so you're in Cluj, right? So if you, you could resolve a human hair in Berlin, so something like that. That's the, that's the kind of resolutions that we can achieve using very long baseline interferometry. So cool. Um, to give another example, so this is 3C84, one of my one of my favorite sources, which is the center of the Perseus cluster, uh, so it's known as Perseus A or NGC 1275. And you have this beautiful image, which is an overlay of a Hubble Space Telescope image and some X-ray images. And as you can see, it's a it's a very beautiful source. Um, but what happens if we look in the VLBI? Well, we can actually so in the top right here, you can see um you can see oops, yeah around here that there's a black hole in here and you can see that it's spurting out some uh, some jets and we can actually trace it along over the course of a few years moving in in real time basically uh so that's the the kind of power that we have with um with with very long baseline interferometry so what is VLBI? Uh, so you know it's just like a normal interferometry, which we haven't really covered yet, but just with very long baselines. So we can use the entire Earth for this. In fact, we can even go into space. Um, and so one way to think about what we're doing is that any two radio antennas are, are equivalent to the slits in the dual slit experiment. So the, the classic uh, Thomas Young interferometry experiment. So you have your light source going through. It goes through these little slits, and then you get an interference pattern on a screen behind the behind the slits. And so, what you can think about, you can kind of think about it as if the uh, radio telescopes are in fact the slits. So your, and then using a little bit of complicated maths, we can reconstruct the fringe pattern. And this is actually the core of how we in practice do things. I uh, should. Um, so if you've ever done a bit of interferometry in, in even high school science or something like this, 
creating interference patterns. As I said, think of the two telescopes as being the actual slits themselves that the light is coming through. Um, so, so for people who know what I'm talking about here, so what we're actually doing is we are measuring the Fourier transform of the sky brightness distribution. Uh, but what does that actually mean? Well, we'll get back to that. Um, and I should put a little proviso here. So actually the, the picture that I have on the right is actually dealing only really with, uh, with visibility amplitudes or fringe amplitudes. So you actually need the, the phases to, to do this in much more detail. Okay. So let's move on. Yeah, so this, right? So what does that really mean about uh, taking the Fourier transform? Well, uh, in some sense, the, the Fourier transform is taking a complicated thing and splitting it into lots of simple things. Um, and I, I, should give, uh, I should give credit to a sort of quasi-student of mine, uh, David Fernandez-Gill, who came up with that explanation of the Fourier transform. Um, but I, I like that sort of explanation because it becomes kind of useful later when uh, we're trying to understand exactly what we're doing in VLBI. So, okay, um, at, the, at the very basics, you know, a radio telescope is fundamentally just an antenna. And what is an antenna? Uh, well, it's basically just some, some uh, wire, right? It's just some metal in, in, in effect. And in radio astronomy, we are, as you can see, we are primarily concerned with receiving radio waves as opposed to transmitting them. There are like Arecibo, which crashed down a few um, a few years ago. I could also transmit and do radar and things like this. Uh, but basically, in we are primarily concerned about receiving radio waves. So at its core fundamental level, what's going on here? So you have an electromagnetic wave packet, if you like. Um, to use the correct quantum mechanical term, um, comes along and it uh, generates so an electric current in the wire. And then uh, this electric current produces a voltage. And this is actually what we, we measure. We are measuring voltages or strictly speaking, changes in voltages. Um, and of course, you know, the antennas that we have, they are most sensitive to the wavelength that matches the length of the wire. But and that, that's a whole science altogether, like designing the, the best kind of antennas for things is yeah, a really, really big topic and people do their PhDs on it. But the, the short version here is that you know, in astronomy, unless you're doing you know, something like neutrinos or gravitational waves, we are measuring electromagnetic waves. And the electromagnet, we measure them by having the electromagnetic waves generate current inside wires, which we measure as voltages. And that's how we actually can uh, see radio light. So hopefully everyone has at least a rough understanding of what we're going on here. So with that in mind, how do we actually see radio light? Well, uh, so on the right here, we have the, the Parkes radio telescope, which is one of the, uh, the most famous telescopes in the world. Um, it was part of a movie called The Dish, which I recommend everyone sees. It's, it's, it's pretty nice. Anyway, so, so basically the idea here is that when you point your radio telescope at something that has a radio signal, uh, it will generate a voltage and this will generate a response from the telescope. And this is what this uh, yellow line is over here. Um, I just want to check the chat to see if there's anyone saying anything. Okay. So, so basically, um, you will only get a response from the telescope if you're pointing at something uh, where that is actually generating a radio light, right? Uh, I think that should be fairly obvious. So on the right here, you can see the, the graph going up and down, the response going up and down, the voltages going up and down. That's fundamentally what we are measuring. Um, so as the, as the graph goes up and down and up and down and up and down like this, that means that we are you know, pointing our telescope at something emitting radio light and then not uh, something not emitting radio light. Um, so what that means is that we can only see radio light in the direction where 
the radio light is coming from. If we're not pointing that way, we can't see where the we can't see the radio light, right? I think that's pretty simple, but it, you know, it's good to keep the the basics of what we're doing in mind. Um, and what that means, you know, if the if it's a star, for example, uh, we can determine the location of the star by using or well, your radio star in this case by uh, pointing your telescope in that direction. Um, and, that, and that makes sense. It's like, you know, if there's, you get a response in the direction of where the star is, and then you move your telescope away, you don't get a response. So you know that where you're pointing that part of the sky is where your radio star was coming from. Cool. Hopefully everyone, is everyone following along with this? It's, it's really hard to get feedback. Um, <laughs> oh, no, um, but if uh, I, I know everyone says you know put uh, requests into the group chat and no one ever does that, but um, can I get some feedback? Is everyone following along and understanding what I'm saying? Yes, we are. Okay, good. So okay, so let's um, let's think about this at a at a simple level. So if have a star here, uh, your radio star, and then it it moves across the the beam of the telescope, All right? So where is drawer? So the should we find? So the the telescope can sort of well, I did a really bad job of that. Uh, the telescope can see basically this way, and then the star is going this way across. So what would be the response of the telescope? What would the telescope see? Um, it's going to be a little bit tricky to um, uh, it's going to be a little bit tricky to get sort of feedback in these sorts of lectures, but let's do it anyway. Ooh, clear my drawings. Mickey Mouse. Oh, yeah, there you go. Turns out that uh, I like to build uh, twirling radio telescopes just for fun. And anyway, oh, more or less for twirling. I don't know what my animation skills are fantastic. What can I say? Um, and then the radio star moves across the beam of the telescope. And what do we get? We get a response like this, right? So the radio telescope, and so as the as the star moves in to where the radio telescope can see, the response goes up. And then when it moves out, the response goes down. Okay, I think that's, hopefully everyone can, uh, can you know, follow along with what's going on here. It's very, very simple, at least I, I like to think so. And another 12, because why not? And then star, okay, yeah, I really need to improve my animation skills. Um, now, I can ask the question, uh, what happens if a source happens to be bigger? Um, anybody want to anybody want to guess in the group chat? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I much prefer the signal stronger. No, not exactly. Uh, no, the peak won't be taller either. Yes, uh, Lazar got that. Lazar Bogdan got that there. Exactly. So the width will be larger. So a bit more twirling because you know the the coolest telescopes in the world always twirl like that. Um, twirl around again. And yes, that's exactly right. You will get a uh, a larger, a, a broader response, a wider response on your radio telescope. Cool. And more twirling. Yep. So basically, in this situation, we have said that we have resolved the source. Um, and we know how big it is on the sky. So because, you know, because it's going across the beam of the telescope and we get this broad response like this, we can actually determine the, the, the size, or at least the, the maximum extent of the size of the source. Now, uh, another next question. What happens if the source is smaller? Any guesses?
Um, so some people say you know, they resemble a pulse. No, it wouldn't resemble a pulse. Um, sharp, not exactly. I think that um, Warad was probably best answer here. The width is lesser, indeed, but it won't be a, it won't be sharp exactly. So in this case, of more twirling, of course. Uh, if you have a smaller uh, radio star like this, it moves across the beam of the telescope. And the telescope, of course, has to do a twirl, because very important. Another twirl again. And you actually will get the same response as at the start. Right? So um, this is this is the same the same we had at the, the very start. Right? So the source is smaller, but we still get the same response from the telescope. Um, so can anyone guess what we what word we use for this situation? <laughs> yes, well, you, you might need a big, bigger telescope. That's true, but uh, but I'm talking about more fundamentally. What's what is this situation? I'm sure you guys have all heard of this words. Um, And so, the, uh, of course, you have to have a twirl. The word is it is unresolved. So the so what's going on here? So um, you get the same response no matter how small the source is. So long as it's detected, uh, you'll get the same response. The source is unresolved. Uh, the opposite of an extended image, actually. So we actually we'll we'll touch on that in uh, a little bit later. Um, so if the if the source is smaller than what the uh, the region of the region of the sky that the telescope can see, um, then you will be detecting an unresolved source. And actually, for people who've done uh, a little bit of uh, astronomy in the past, even optical astronomy or something like this, this is why we call it the point spread function. So basically, unresolved things should give a uh, a point response. Hence the point spread function. Um, that's where that's where the term comes from. And more twirling, of course. So, so basically, another way to think about this is that the telescope is sensitive to a certain amount of sky, right? So on the left here, so the the telescope here on the left with its eyes, it can see something within the the blue the blue area. Uh, that's its angular resolution, actually. And the star, the your radio star here, is actually uh, smaller than the resolution of the telescope. So therefore, it's unresolved. Uh, we can detect that something is there, but we can't tell how big it actually is. Uh, we just ha have uh, limits on it. It's the upper limit on the size of the of the source. Um, and uh, the question is. Yeah, yes, basically all we can say is that we know that the uh, the source is somewhere inside that green circle. So then the question is, uh, what happens if we add a second dish? Yeah. Any sort of guesses what sort of um, what sort of uh, response we'll get if we have a second dish? No, not transit. So remember, the second dish is going to be at a different location on the Earth, which means that it's going to have a uh, slightly different view of the same patch of sky, right? So same sky, but slightly different view of it. Um, so Eddie's right, uh, it would give you a sharper image. Um, so I think <laughs> I think some people have, might have a little bit of experience in interferometry, um, but that's cool. So. Once again, you have to have some swinging of the uh, of the dishes. So you've got the second dish is far away. We can actually constrain the location of the star with better accuracy. And it's more correct to actually to say that uh, we are sensitive to a smaller area of the sky with a second dish. So it's swirl it around a bit, and this is what we get. We get a we get a sharper response from the radio telescope. So, so basically, um, because the second dish is far away and it's looking at the same part of the sky, 
um, we were actually sensitive to a smaller part of the sky, and therefore we could constrain where the radio light is coming from with more accuracy. Um, so, and this happens because you know the dish is looking from it from a slightly different location. Um, I think that's not too difficult to understand, right? Um, everyone following along the stage. So, of course, you know, like if you have any questions, feel free to put it in. Um, but is everyone understanding the uh, you know, at a high at a high level what's happening here? Cool. Yeah. So I'll say it again. So you have two telescopes looking at the same sky, but they have slightly different, slightly offset positions. So when they're looking in the same direction, they'll be uh, and you can combine them together, and you have uh, you're sensitive to a smaller part of the sky. And this this is how a uh, basically how an interferometer works. And more twirling, of course, like this. So then the question is, uh, what happens if we move our second radio telescope further away? Uh, what kind? Of, what happens to our circle? And what will happen to our response? Any guesses? Yep. Yeah, you're right. The area becomes smaller. Yep. But what about the response? Yeah, any guesses on the response? Uh, no, no, the response will not be wider. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by greater response exactly. So if you move the second dish further away, what? So if you have you got it right before, it won't accumulate. No, not exactly. I mean, No, the intensity won't. No, the amplitude should stay the same because the the brightness of the source hasn't changed. So, um, the if the source is brighter, you'll get a stronger response in terms of amplitude. Uh, no, there won't be another spike. Um, we we're just uh, talking about determining the direction of the of the radio waves. No, not too big. So it'll still be just the one peak. Actually, remember we. Remember the uh, by adding the second uh, the second dish, the response became sharper, right? So, what do you think will happen if I move it further away? Uh, well, no. So the the time difference. Yeah, so the response will be narrower. So uh, Daniel got that right. Um, so the the peak uh, is actually taken is made by taking into account the time difference. So I'm kind of avoiding <laughs> getting into uh, delays and rates and that sort of thing. Um, and yes, Eddie's correct. The resolution will improve. So yeah, let's do the. I think people are getting the idea now. The response will be narrower. The resolution improved. Lots of swelling here, of course, like this. And there you go. So that's the difference. You're, you have a narrower uh, region on the sky. This green now, the green field becomes narrower like this, and the response becomes narrower as well. So what that means is that if you're if you move your dishes further apart, you actually get better angular resolution. Um, so that's uh, it's kind of the special source of doing uh, radio interferometry. Um, good. Now, what happens if we uh, add a third dish to the mix? Um, well, actually, it's a sharper and tall, not necessarily tall. So remember, the, the height of your response is actually related to how bright the source is. Uh, we're not dealing with that today. We're just talking about the actual like, the width of the source. So... Um, 
<laughs> yes, uh, Daniel, good question. We'll we'll, uh, we'll come to that. Um, if you hold tight for a few more minutes, we'll we'll get to that. Um, but for now, what's the so what happens if we add the third dish? What would be the response? And I'll admit there's a little bit of a trick question here. So, so actually, the answer is we had our third dish here. There he is, a very beautiful dish, a lot of twirling, of course. Actually, we'll end up having to add another dimension. <laughs> so, but as you can see here, if we add the third dish, we have more like a, a three-dimensional response, actually. Um, but we're sensitive to a very, very small part of the sky. Right, so does that make sense? So now we have the third dish on a another angle like this, and remember we're on the Earth, so the Earth is actually a three-dimensional sphere. Um, we become a lot more, we become sensitive to a smaller and smaller part of the sky, and in a different direction as well. Does that make sense? Another 12. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so you want to explain a bit more about the 3D response. So in the single, well, I'll talk a bit more about this over the next few slides. Um, but basically the the 3D response you can or you can think of it as being the uh, point spread function of your uh interferometric array. Um so when you add up all your different telescopes, if you have like 10 or so of them, you will have a uh, 3D response like this. And this is telling you the angular resolution of your telescope. Um, that's the actual thing. And of course, because um, you can think of it as being, you could flatten this out and make it two-dimensional as a two-dimensional thing on the sky. But the, the third dimension here is actually the um, the brightness. So in the, in the previous example, uh, 2D, so we have a one dimension in resolution and one dimension in brightness, which I have sort of um, glossed over a little bit here. So in this picture, we have two dimensions in resolution and one dimension in brightness. And the two dimensions in resolution correspond to the uh, resolutions, your uh, effectively your X and Y, your RA and DEC on the sky. Uh, does that Does that make more sense? Okay, cool. Um, okay, so that's a little bit more complicated than we started. So any more questions before I move on? All right, well, there seems to be no more questions, so let's move on. Yeah. More, one more twirl, of course. So this uh, goes back to a little bit uh, Daniel's question here. So. Uh, the further apart in different directions, the finer detail you can detect. Um, but what happens if the source is actually bigger than the region that your telescope can see? Any guesses there? Uh, no, not saturation. Uh, yes, actually, uh, well, Gunn's right. So in, in a sense, you do get a flat surface, um, but actually it's, it's kind of worse than that. I'd say uh, you have to have a twirl, of course. Uh, you'll actually see nothing is the answer. So if you have your interferometer and you're looking at a part of the sky that's so small, but the source itself is bigger, you will actually detect nothing. Uh, and in uh, in in the industry, we call that resolving out the source. Um, so what that means is that you need to have lots of uh, lots of dishes in lots of different places to make the image. So if you have the very very long baselines, you'll be you'll be sensitive to only the small scales. Um, and uh, if anyone, uh, if that sounds familiar to anyone, that's because it's, of course, the uh, the Fourier transform. Um, yes. I'll get back to that. And 
so you need to have telescopes close together and also um so the VLT is a little bit more complicated. Uh, so that opt operates at optical wavelengths, and it's really, really hard to do this sort of thing in the optical because uh, quantum effects, basically. Um, but like, recently, they've been able to get around these sorts of things. But in in the radio, um, the quantum effects are not so not so severe, so we can do these sorts of things. Um, but if you see the VLA uh, for the very large array in New Mexico. Uh, that does have different configurations, or ALMA in uh, in Chile. Exactly, that's exactly right. So they they do move the dishes apart, and that affects the resolution of the instrument. So it depends on what you're trying to look at, and um, you know, you know, maybe you want uh, the more sensitive to larger scales or smaller scales. It really depends on the science that you're doing. Um, but it's uh, a very important point to remember when you're doing uh, interferometry because naively might think okay we just put our telescopes uh, at the longest possible baselines and then uh, you do you do your thing and that's not really how it works so you have to have a bit of both and of course you have to have uh, twirling telescopes this is also uh, really important so what's going on here is that by connecting up all of the dishes at the same time you're creating a uh, virtual telescope uh, and that and the Angular resolution is equivalent to the size of the distance between the most distant telescopes. But as I said before, you have to be very, very careful with this because otherwise you will resolve out things. Effectively, it's a high pass filter. If you only have the um, only have the long long baselines like that. Um, and so that is basically how uh, VLBI works. Uh, so it's as I said, it's I actually don't think it's that complicated to get a uh, a bit of a hand wavy feeling for for how it works. Um, of course, the the details of it are far more complicated, and uh, there are people that can explain that better than I can. But uh, I think that it's uh, much more important to get a feeling intuitively for what's going on uh, before diving into the maths and that sort of thing. So that's but that's just me. Um, so as I said, you know, remember, um, having uh, having telescopes close together is important too, because if they're too far apart, you'll actually resolve out structure and you'll get, obviously, if you're missing details like this, you'll just not see uh, everything and you could make uh, mistakes in the science that you're trying to do. So yeah, in a nutshell, you know, radio telescopes work by determining which direction radio waves are coming from. Uh, the bigger any single dish, the more accurately it can determine where the radio waves are coming from. That's what Dr. Lung talked about last time. Uh, but if you connect more and more dishes, you can use them to measure where the radio waves are coming from, uh, from different places on the Earth, and that allows an image to be made. And this is the core idea of radio interferometry. Um, and normally that's where I'd finish it, but I added another slides here. And so I brought back our super... Uh, well-drawn radio telescopes here. And for some reason, they uh, are looking at a duck because ducks are cool. And so what's going on here? So what do they actually look? Well, what do they actually see? So if you remember back to when you had a two-element interferometer, it was kind of like a very long ellipse, uh, a little bit like a line in some sense. So one way to think about this uh, or at least another way to think about it, is that you can think of each pair of telescopes uh, making 1D slices across the source. Um, and so basically you have uh, more of these 1D slices and you'll make a, a better image. So the more, the more dishes you have, the more 1D slices, the better the image will become. And remember that the short baselines correspond to the long line on the image. Once again, this is a this is a I jumped ahead a bit too out there. Um, so the long line on the image here is equivalent to the two telescopes that are closest together, whilst the short the short line the short one D slice is equivalent to the longest baselines. So the um, so that's why we have two short lines on the duck, one long line on the duck. Um, because remember, you know the the uh, closer you are together, 
the more sensitive to larger scales you are and vice versa. Um, as again, this is a Fourier analysis. And of course, the Earth moves, and that means that the dishes move as well. And that means that as the Earth moves around, you can, that's exactly right. So each, um, in the array, there are telescope pairs, and, it, and that's basically the lines that we are looking at. All right. Um, so, and uh, I think it's more correct to say that the telescope itself is all of the dishes, and it uses all of these baseline pairs to create these 1D slices, and you get lots and lots and lots of them to create a radio image. Uh, that's more like it. And then um, as the Earth rotates, uh, you can do this again every, you know, every like uh, 10 minutes or something like this, and then you can get even more uh, different sized 1D slices across the source. Uh, so this is a very simplified idea of what's going on. Um, but you can see here, and then I'm going to draw in this uh, like so. You can see here well, that that ellipse here is roughly speaking, the resolution of the telescope, um, which is known as the beam. So, okay, does, so does that make sense? Is everybody following here? Cool, I, I got one yes, so I'm just going to extrapolate that onto everyone else. <laughs> but yeah, I'll say it again, just, uh, just in case. So each telescope pair, is taking a one-dimensional slice across the sky because it's sensitive to a single uh, part of the sky. And if you have lots of them together, you can add them all up and you can create a, a radio image out of this. Um, I don't. Th I think it's fairly simple. And, th and that's how you actually create these uh, very long baseline interferometry images. And just to go back to the... Uh, back to the, what we're talking about here. Here are all my drawings. Um, and else. The Fourier transform it takes a complicated thing and splits it into lots of simple things. Uh, actually, I just copied and pasted it. I should <laughs> remove the bit a bit about remembering this because it's important. But that's basically what we're doing, right? So uh, the Fourier transform is take, takes a complicated thing and splits it up into lots of simple things. So what we're doing here is we're taking lots of one simple 1D slices of where the radio emission is coming through, coming on the sky, and then we're creating an image by just pu putting lots and lots and lots of 1D slices on top of each other. So if you've ever done any Fourier analysis, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, but that is basically how we make radio images using uh, using interferometry. So hopefully that makes some sense. Um, I like to include this as well. So if you're a little bit more mathematically minded, because we're talking about Fourier transforms. Um, so you may remember that the Thomas Young's double slit experiment, we mentioned it earlier. Um, and, uh, you know, I said, you know, his experiment is called the interference experiment. And the technique described here is called deferometry. So this is, uh, this is not a coincidence. So the, the radio signals are actually interfered with each other in order to make a Fourier transform of the image. So what we are actually measuring is the Fourier transform of the sky brightness distribution, um, which is a fancy way of saying we are taking lots and lots of 1D, 1D slices across the source. Um, and if you've never heard of a Fourier transform, I think my, my favorite way to describe what the Fourier transform is actually doing. Um, so if you have a, uh, a bus timetable here, so this is one from London, uh, so the the uh, the normal time space here is you have the timetable like you know, 5 a.m. 5 5 5:45, 6 a.m. and then the uh, the Fourier transform of that would be uh, a bus comes every 15 minutes, something like that, and then the phase information would be saying that you start at uh, at zero zero, and if you out of phase a little bit, it'd be starting at zero one. Um, that is of uh, describing the Fourier transform. And uh, that is, you know, in effect what we're doing with uh, in radio interferometry and with in creating radio images. Um, now, I'm going to bring it up this a little bit. So uh, what, there is several uh, VLBI arrays in the world, and the one that we are going to play with is called 
the very long baseline array. So uh, what happens? You just have the view line spread over the world. Um, you get yeah, you get the uh, very long baseline array. And this is based in the United States. So there are uh, 10 telescopes, uh, the longest baseline going from the Virgin Islands all the way through to Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Um, and of course, I, I, I personally work uh, a lot with the VLBA. Um, the cool thing is there's lots of um, lots of uh, public data around. It's actually really easy to access some of this data. And that's exactly what we're planning to do today, or probably more next week. But for today, I'll just give a uh, brief introduction. Um, and by the way, so there you have a Pie Town dish in New Mexico. Um, and I've actually been there. And I, uh, kind of interesting. It's called Pie Town because it has uh, basically only two shops and they sell pies. So cool. Um, we have a quick word about the Korean VLBI network, which is uh, Korea's own VLBI network. That's uh, why I am in Korea. Um, and in my opinion, it's going to be the, uh, the, the future of millimeter wave, wavelength radio astronomy. And in fact, it already is. Uh, it's very impressive technology, but of course, Korea is not a very big place. So we are building out extensions to Spain, Italy, and Australia and uh, potentially uh, China and South Africa coming on in the future as well. And uh, maybe Finland and Germany and uh, Sweden. So this is uh, possibly the United States as well. So it's really, uh, the Koreans are really exporting their technology. So the cool thing about it is that it can observe four frequencies at the same time. Um, I won't dwell too much on this, just to tell you that it exists. If you're interested, um, have more interest in this, then you're more than welcome to uh, ask me about it after the, after the show. Okay. Uh, give me, oh, cool. Uh, no, not the space field, yeah. um, so the, the Russians, they launched a dish into space uh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, Japan also did, did it uh, maybe 20 years ago, you know, long before I existed, um, and it's still going. And uh, in fact, here is the 3C84 that I showed you at the start with the, with the little movie. Uh, this is uh, what the, the jet looks like using space VLBI at 22 gigahertz. And so this is one of the most high resolution images ever taken. Um, and in fact, this was published in Nature Astronomy uh, a few years ago and in across here. So looking right down where the, the black hole is, this is only 1000 terrestrial radio across. Um, probably a bit worse than that, but um, something like this. And so this, uh, to give an idea about this, you know, these sorts of, these sources, they are, you know, billions, I was about some uh, millions of light years away. And the size scale here is about 0 0.1 parsecs, which is uh, uh, much, much less than one light year. So this is roughly, probably smaller than the size of the solar system, something like this. And we can see, we can resolve that from, uh, from here, and so that I personally think that's pretty amazing. And of course, uh, finally, GMVA and the HT. So GMVA stands for the Global Millimeter VLBI Array. Uh, that's actually what I did my PhD on. Um, and the Event Horizon Telescope is just basically uh, the GMVA, just one step up in resolution. Um, apart from space VLBI, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope has the highest angular resolution of anything in the world. And that, of course, is the telescope that made the famous black hole image. Um, so that's my conclusion for the first part. I'm just going to leave it at uh, radio astronomy is really cool. Um, but then I'm going to skip ahead here and say, OK, uh, go download some data. So on here, we have the link. So people who successfully managed to get diffmap installed. Um, so I'm going to quit out of my. Um, and here. So what we can do is we can go to this website here. Um, I'll put it, I'll copy it and put it into the, into the chat. Like so. And then you'll go to this uh, website here. So Mojave is a, 
Blazar or Quasar monitoring program that's been going on for decades now. And luckily enough, they put all their data publicly on the web. So you can, you know, they have hundreds of sources here and you can uh, choose any of them that you like. You can just click on one of them. So for example, I'm going to click on this source here, 1227 plus 255, which is ON246. And here, here it is. Um, <laughs> interestingly, it doesn't have a known redshift or anything like this. Um, it has been detected in the gamma ray, so this is from there. So I won't uh, dwell too much on the details here. But the, the important point here is that you, uh, you can go on this website and then you can download some data yourself and play around with it and have fun. Um, it, has anyone met is everyone on this website themselves had some success yeah are, are you looking at the website now cool so once you're here i mean it doesn't matter which source you're at it doesn't really matter if you want to if you want to use the same one that i am this is the uh yeah so i put so for Constantine, I put the website in the group chat here. Um, so this is the uh, website for the Mojave VLBI monitoring program. Um, I'll send out later, I'll send a link with a bit more detail on this. And if you're interested, this is the source I'm looking at right now. So you can look it up. And then once you're here, um, on, so on the on the bottom here, you have the table, and this has all the observations that they've made of this source. Um, so on the right here, you have the observation date, the VLBA code, that's just the uh, experiment code, VLBA I, P, and P percentage, they are the brightness in uh, total intensity, the polarized intensity, and the fractional uh, polarized intensity. We haven't spoken about polarization, so we don't need to worry about that. If you click, so I image natural weights, um, I haven't spoken too much, but if you click the PNG like here, you can see this is their image of the source. You can just press back um, and they have tapered to, to large scales. Here's the resolution in effect. And we don't need to worry about it. And we've got the uh, wide field image as well. So are these things, the, the, the important bit is, so we have the, so over here, oops, we have a uh, column here called visibility data. And this is the, this is the important one that we want to look at uh, with our hands-on demonstration of what's going on here. So the easiest way to handle this, as long as you have uh, DiffMap installed, is to right-click and go copy link address, like so. It doesn't matter any of any of the uh, any of the data that is in the UVF column. And you just, yeah, as I said, doesn't make, I could change this one, copy, right click, copy link address. And then once you've done that, go to, I should actually quit out of diff map. Um, in your terminal, just go wget and then paste the UVF file in and then press enter. And then it should uh, download, download your uh your data into the into here cool so um does anyone need me to slow down a bit don't be shy if you um we can you can uh, message me privately if you think i'm moving too quickly
I assume that uh, everyone is doing a wonderful job and perfectly and understands 100% of what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> okay. So once you're in diffmap, so you just start diffmap by typing diffmap like this, and then you just type observe. And in this case, it's uh, 1227, so you can do tab complete. Uh, observe 1227 plus 255.u.2020 underscore 07 underscore 02 dot uvf. I'll give it a few seconds. You just press enter once you're done. Um, and then you can see it has four channels. You don't need to know about that, but the frequency is uh, 1.5 times 10 to the 10 hertz, which is 15 gigahertz, which is equivalent to two centimeters. Four polarizations. We don't, don't need to worry about that. So the first thing we do is select LL, which is basically equivalent to Stokes I. If you know, the total intensity is effectively your LL, so your left left polarizations, but we're not talking about that for today. Um, then uh, set a map size. I will talk more about this next week, but 1024, 0 0.1 should be fine. But first, what I'm going to do is load. I'll, I'll just give it a couple of. Uh, yeah. I, you can't read what I type. OK. Um, Oh, that's a bit annoying. But can you still see my screen? Like when when I'm down here? Or is it only staying on the uh so you can't see what I'm typing. So you, you can yeah, sure I can do that. Um but can you see my diff map window? And you, can you see me switching between the windows like this? Okay, okay. So you just can't see what I'm typing. All right, no problem. So that's probably the easier way then. I'll just do it. And I'll, and I'll, so luckily, diffmap actually saves the commands. So you, you can, and I can send that around afterwards. And you can uh, look in the my history, basically, to see what I've been doing. Okay, no problems. Uh, so for now, I'll just what I'm doing. So the first thing to, I'll do is I'll look up the I'm called rad plot. No, no, not sorry, no, not rad plot. UV plot, like this. And then when the graphics device thing comes, it just goes slash xw. It goes like this. And this is your UV coverage. It's the so-called UV coverage. So can everyone see that? I'll move this down one window. Cool. Yeah, so you can see. Great. Cool. So what are we looking at here? So this is, yeah. So this, in fact, is the, uh, you can think of this as being us being at the quasar itself and looking down at the Earth. So all these green dots are, in fact, pairs of telescopes. So each, so there's going to be lots of different telescopes. And each of these telescope pairs, so in the center, are going to be the, the uh, lower resolution and the closer together telescopes. The one at the outside here is going to be equivalent to the highest resolution. Um, so let's actually do a little bit of a calculation then. So the um, the resolution of your telescope is set by the uh, lambda on D, right? So I have a little Google Doc that's set here. So resolution is uh, wavelength divided by diameter. So in this case, 
wavelength is equal to two centimeters, which is equal to 15 units, according, right? Okay. What about the diameter? Right? What's the aperture of what we're looking at? Let's go back down. So you'll see here that you have U and V, and you can see the units here, right? Um, can I zoom in a bit more? Let's make this a bit bigger. Yeah, this is this is as big as I can make it, I'm afraid. Um, so hopefully you can see okay. And you can see that the Ah, yes, in Word also. Yeah, sure, I can zoom that in a bit further. So the resolution is, is wavelength of lambda. lambda. Uh, lambda on basically. So but what is the diameter? So wavelength is two centimeters. Okay. And when we go back to the UV plot, you can see the units are in 10 to the, 10 to the 6, so uh, millions of wavelengths. So remember, the resolution is set by the, the biggest distance between your telescopes. So from here, we're going from 0 all the way out to roughly 400 million wavelengths. Right. So 400 times 10 to the 6 wavelengths. So diameter equals 400 E6 wavelengths. Right. And remember our wavelengths. So that means it's 400 E6 times uh, 2 centimeters. And we can do this in good old Wolfram. So E6 times two centimeters. So that's going to be 8,000 kilometers, right? Eight thousand kilometers. Cool. So eight thousand kilometers. That's the uh, that's the d. That's the aperture of our telescope. So we have the data that you're looking at here is, is using a t eight thousand kilometer big telescope. So that's uh, pretty cool in my opinion. That's pretty easy to use. In fact. So 4,000 kilometers, what's our resolution? So lambda is two centimeters, right? That's our wavelength uh, divided, divided by 8,000 kilometers. So it's pretty convenient. We can do this in, so yep. Wolfram Alpha is pretty awesome. It does all these sorts of things. So it's going to be, two centimeters divided by 4,000 times 10 to the six times two centimeters. And it actually gives the answer in the radians uh, in milli arc seconds. And there you go. So, so Wolfram Alpha is nice. It converts all your uh, units for you. So, um, so the answer is of course, uh, let's put this in here. So the resolution is going to be 2.5. So res. Yep. 2.5 E9, well, minus 9 radians, which is equal to 2.5 milli arc seconds. If I remember that correctly. So that means that our 8,000 kilometer baseline at two centimeters observing wavelength is equivalent to five milli arc seconds angular resolution, uh, which is 
This is very, very high resolution, I have to say. We can do a little bit better by, by going to space or by going to higher frequencies. Um, but uh, that's basically it. Um, so let's have a quick look. I'll just do I'll zoom over this bit because we're running out of time. But uh, this is the, the raw data of the image. And next week, I'll show you a bit how to actually deal with this. But I'll just show you now. Uh, oops. Oh, I wanted to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. Cool. Oh. I'll just do it very, very quickly to show you how it works. Oops. Yeah. Oops. Do, 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 do. And here we go. Now, you're starting to see the, uh, the source here. So this is what the, the source looks like. And we can create an image out of this. And remember, so you can see the beam here. Uh, so down at the bottom, it says beam full with half maximum. So 0 0.84 times 0 0.43 milliarcseconds. So there you go. Basically uh, correct. That's right, yes. So that's exactly what we're doing. We're doing the, uh, we actually do things in the Fourier space. So if you go to the rad plot, you can see here. So actually the red components here are your model because um, they're basically, basically lots, an addition of lots and lots of Gaussians. In this case, the clean is adding uh, 1D Gaussians, but we'll talk more about that next week and what's actually going on here. Um, you can even, if it makes it look a bit better, so proj plot like this. So this goes in 3D. So you, if I spin around like this, I think this gives a pretty good feeling for how, what the actual, what we're actually observing. So remember, think about this as looking up, looking down at the earth from the source. And these, all these data points are, are all these 1D slices effectively across the source at different times of the day, like as the earth moves around, like so. And cool, so no, that's not the spectrum. This is actually the UV radius. So each of these, each of these dots is a pair of telescopes. So, so each baseline pair, so you can think of each of these green dots on, on this on this plot as being one dimensional slices that we were talking about before so when we try to create the radio image we can take you know, you know millions and millions of of these one dimensional slices and then we try to put them together to create the radio image um the problem is you know so people have touched on this if you uh doing the inverse Fourier transform the problem is so we go back to our uv plot um, this is, you can think of this as being the Fourier transform, at least of the, uh, the amplitudes of the, of the image. And you may notice a big problem, um, with this. And the big problem is that, uh, most of the Fourier information is missing. <laughs> so, um, so it's actually quite difficult to reconstruct the, the true image, uh, from it. And this is what we'll talk about next week. Um, but, but for now, and one thing I'll do before I, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. I'll leave it there. Um, I think that's probably enough information, but you can think of each of these green dots as being a baseline pair and, uh, you know, the, the more baseline pairs you have, the better the image is going to be. And the more spread out they are, the higher resolution you'll get everything being equal. Cool. So I think I'll I'll leave it there for now. Uh, hopefully you have a at least a rough feeling for uh, how VLBI operates. Um, and uh, I recommend that you download some of the data from the Mojave website and have a play around with it yourself. I'll send some instructions because apparently uh, you couldn't see my typing. I'll send around what I did before and uh, later and you can have a play around yourself in my opinion it's much more much more fun to just play around with the data and hopefully next week everyone has diff map installed and then we can actually do some 
uh, getting dirty with the data, basically. And I think, I think that's the best way to understand or at least get a feeling for what's what's happening in radio astronomy. Great. So thanks a lot. Uh, any any questions? Yeah, thanks, Jacobo. Yes, of course, you're more than welcome to email me. Yep, no problem. So see you next week. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so I guess there are no yep, more no questions, way. but if there are, uh, Jeff is available on email to answer them. And in any case, uh, we will see you all next week. Thank you. Yep, Goodbye. Sounds good. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. Ciao. Goodbye. Have a nice day. Bye. Yeah, you too. Well, it's seven thirty here, so it's TGIF uh, time. Uh, ciao. Uh, Have a nice evening, Dan. <laughs> Have a nice evening. Yeah, you too.